in uh, the patients on, on in, um, what's the name of that capsule? Spiriva. Have you guys have you guys seen patients? It's like a little capsule you put there, you puncture it, and you inhale it. So that really made a difference in the way we manage these patients because they that that actually associates with less use of uh, beta agonist. Excessive use of beta agonist is associated with death in, in COPD patients. And uh, and if they're failing this, then you go to the last resort, which is inhaled corticosteroids. You can see here that I never mentioned steroids. But when the patients exacerbate, you may need to use oral steroids. But this is actually an algorithm for the management of most uh, stable outpatient uh, COPD patients. Oops. Okay. And the non-pharmacological therapy, like I said, you need to make sure you vaccinate all of your patients. Pneumovax, Pregnar 13, and influenza should be mandatory for every smoker or for every patient at risk of developing lung disease. And uh, pulmonary rehabilitation, there's centers that you refer the patient. It's like sending them for physical therapy. You're just doing pulmonary rehabilitation. They have all sorts of exercises. It's very effective. They do uh, chest uh, physical therapy and they have like all sorts of devices like vibration and um, to release the phlegm and to be able to, to help these patients. Have you, have you seen how they do respiratory therapy in a hospitalized patient? They have all sorts of like devices they, they use to loosen up all the secretions. Um, yeah, supplemented volume. Lung volume, LVRS is lung volume reduction surgery. Okay, I wrote it down and I forgot. It's lung volume reduction surgery in lung transplant. Okay, so restrictive lung disease uh, is also known as interstitial lung disease and is also known as the uh, uh, parenchymal, diffuse parenchymal lung disease. So these terms are interchangeable, so don't let them confuse you. Probably the easier thing to remember is, let's just call it ILD, interstitial lung diseases. It's probably the easier way to remember it. Or because they, when they tell you DPLD, diffuse parenchymal lung disease, or restrictive lung disease, restrictive is because they have a restrictive pattern on the PFTs. So, but the definition of this group of diseases, any disease process that, that results in a decrease in the, in the total lung capacity, like I said, like I showed you the example of the obesity, the neuromuscular disease, and as well as the patient with restrictive lung disease. Um, but diffuse parenchymal lung disease or interstitial lung disease, these are the, 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 this is the differential. So actually on the very left, you have like, like collagen vascular diseases. Remember we talk about like scleroderma, scleroderma causing like, like uh, interstitial lung disease. Uh, but we also have the idiopathic interstitial pneumonia, IIP. For the purpose of this talk, I'm going to call it IIP. And we have the granulomatous diffused uh, parenchymal lung disease, such as sarcoidosis. You need to know about sarcoidosis because you're going to get a question on your board about sarcoidosis. It's quite common. And um, so, and we have um, other, other, other forms like um, of diffused parenchymal lung disease. I'm going to cover some of them. So from the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias from the IIP, we actually have the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, or IPF, and other, other forms of idiopathic interstitial pneumonias, like we have all this desqu desquamative interstitial pneumonia, acute interstitial pneumonia, non-specific non interstitial pneumonia, respiratory bronchiolitis, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, and lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia. So this this category, you probably don't need to memorize it. We can actually skip the, 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 the slides on this one, but I put it here so you guys remember that when you hear the word diffuse parenchymal lung disease, it's the same thing that I'm telling you, oh, this person has a fever. Fever from what? So diffuse parenchymal lung disease, the differential is pretty broad. It's either one of the DPL related to a rheumatologic disease or a drug, or like the idiopathic category. In the idiopathic, we have the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis versus the other ones. And maybe one of these, I, I'll, show you, I'll show you which one, probably you need to memorize two of them and you'll be fine for your boards. Okay, so this is a normal chest x-ray on the left and here you can see like there is, you know, you're not sure, like you see like, oh maybe, maybe this person has some interstitial markings, you know, this, this actually, this costophrenic angle is abnormal. Maybe there's something over here. So you're going to see this all the time. When you suspect that there is something, the next step is to high resolution chest CT. So 
and the workup is actually you need to pay attention um, getting a good history occupational any history of traveling drugs any sort of pets you guys know why pets the parrots remember what kind of disease you get with parrots yeah Lamiria, Sitaki. Yeah, so hobbies, you need to find out what the patient's hobbies, systemic disease, smoking family history, and ask for any type of uh, systemic symptoms like rash, arthritis, or fever. And, and obviously, you look for a physical exam, you look for clubbing, rails, or any signs of core pulmonary or any lymph nodes. Lymph nodes, if you, if you hear like shortness of brain lymph nodes, you think about what disease? Sarcoidosis. Okay, very good. So, okay, let me just see if I think there's such a new one. Okay, so, so these are the diagnostic approach for any patient that you suspect like, like interstitial lung disease. So you do a good history, a good physical exam, you do a chest X-ray, and you do PFTs. So if you think this is like um, basically. Um, associated like a systemic disease, collagen, vascular disease, environmental, and drug related, then you actually, you work it up as such. And that's the reason why you get a good history. But you think like this patient is possible that this patient has an idiopathic interstitial pneumonia, then you do a high resolution CT of the chest, and then you can actually be very confident that this is a um, idiopathic pneumonia, or like an IPF, in interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. Um, versus, okay, this person maybe has a, a typical clinical CT features, or maybe this is a different separate process from the lungs. And that's when you start questioning, okay, should I do a transbronchial biopsy? Or should I do a bronchial alveolar lavage? You guys know how they do a transbronchial biopsy? Who does it, by the way? Which specialty in medicine does it? Yeah, the pulmonology. So if you guys like internal medicine, if you're going to pulmonary, it's actually one of the nice things about pulmonary is that you do, you do spend um, some time in the, in, the, in the pulmonary suite doing bronchoscopies. And they do actually, now with the, there is a new specialty that is gaining ground in, in medicine. It's called uh, endoscopic ultrasound. Um, the GI doctors have been doing this for, for about 20 years now, but more and more pulmonary specialists are specializing in endoscopic ultrasonography to be able to diagnose and biopsy um, lung masses in a, in a minimal invasive way. Uh, because in the past, there was very few options. They, they actually, they show it to the interventional radiologist. The radiologist felt comfortable, the patient would get a biopsy. If the interventional radiologist didn't get comfortable, then they would call, they would call a cardiothoracic surgeon and the cardiothoracic surgeon will do either a VATS or like some sort of lobectomy. Now with these new techniques like endoscopic ultrasonography and everything, one of my friends actually does that and she, she's becoming very, very specialized, like getting to parts of the lung that, that before it was like unthinkable that they were able, able to do such a procedure. Um, and, uh, but that's when you start thinking about like, okay, should I do a biopsy, a transbronchial biopsy? And if this is not possible, then you do the surgical lung biopsy. And these are all these weird interstitial lung diseases that I'm going to cover briefly. I guarantee you that if, even if you memorize these names tonight, tomorrow I'll, I'll ask you and you're going to forget them all. So you, know, you don't need to memorize them. This is actually pulmonary fellow knowledge level. It's not, it's not even necessary like for me, like as an internist, a nephrologist, I don't even need to know all of these, these things. But I put it there so you know. There's so many different ones. So studies, we do like all of these um, typical rheumatologic exams in addition to, to basic chemistries. Uh, we do an EKG to rule out heart disease, chest x-ray, obviously. We do an ABG, a six minute walk test, PFTs, DLCO, high resolution CT of the chest. And if you're thinking a very specific disease entity, at this point, probably the patient should be under the care of pulmonologist. You should probably just, I usually, I usually, I usually stop here, right here. Sometimes I stop here. Before I order the CT, I send the patient because if I see a, a chest x-ray that is very abnormal and is non-infectious, I know that my hands are tied because ultimately this patient is going to need to have a name and a last name for that interstitial lung disease that he's dealing with. So which is the earliest PFT abnormality seen in interstitial lung disease? Decrease. 
not probably late. Yeah. DLCO, yeah. So that's probably the earliest abnormality that you can see. So um, there is a. Do you guys know how to calculate an AA gradient, or how do you order an AA gradient? An ABG, yeah. So when you're when you're an intern or resident, and you order an EEG, some of your intern medicine attendants are going to tell you, "Hey, can you calculate the AA gradient?" That's when you pull your iPhone and say, "Like the AA gradient is this, is the PaO2." Can somebody look it up? It's just a formula. I forget what it is. Is the my phone froze? Great. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, so this is a test that you definitely are going to be using in clinical practice when you're working on the words, you're going to be doing an AA gradient. Do you guys know what to do when your phone freezes? Buy a new one? <laughs> just died okay so if the patient is already hypercapnic it's because they're pretty pretty much in trouble okay very good okay so radiology <laughs> uh, PaO2 equals the PiO2 minus PaCO2 Divided by 0.8, yeah. Okay, so just to show you how crazy chest x-ray is very non-specific in diffuse parenchymal lung disease. About 10, you can only see abnormal, it can be normal in up to 60% of the patients with emphysema, 30% of patients with bronchiectasis, and up to 15% of patients with diffuse lung disease. So that's why it's so difficult to diagnose this disease just based on plain x-rays. Then um, the high resolution CT, it actually has a high sensitivity and the specificity approach is almost 100% and can actually provide confident diagnosis of about 50% of the cases. Remember I told you that two pulmonologists may differ the way they read it, um, but because the, these patterns are very are very uh, specific in some diseases but are very non-specific in others. I actually have some examples here that I want to show you. And then the findings that we normally see in diffuse parenchymal lung disease are either ground glass opacity, um, you see some changes consistent with fibrosis and replacement of the, of the parenchyma, lung parenchyma with fibrous tissue, or you can see like interlobular or interlobular septal thickening and the honey, honey combing. I got some pictures for you guys. So this is actually ground glass. Um, you see, it's just uh, the beginning of the process. So when you see an x-ray like this, a uh, CT like this, and you see that the process involving both lungs is more likely to be some sort of like idiopathic or autoimmune. But you can also see it infectious, but um, when you see a lot of little nodules everywhere, you think about metastatic disease. That's one of the things that, um, that is, 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 is something to consider. So this is a more severe spectrum of disease. You can actually see like, like this is a huge pulmonary nodules. I don't know. I don't know what this will be, and um, and you can actually see like fibrosis. Some areas of the lung look fibrotic already. Another example. Uh, this is more like peripheral. So when they talk about like is this central or this is peripheral, this is more like a peripheral pattern. Some diseases they actually have a, a central versus a peripheral pattern, and then a more severe degree when you see this like this is what we call the honey honey combing, which is a more a more uh, is representative, more more advanced um, process, more severe process. So when you see honey combing again, you look at the location, either subpleural or posterior. Um, you see this very frequently in the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, or like hypersensitivity pneumonitis. You probably need to know hypersensitivity pneumonitis for your boards. And uh, but other distribution when it's actually central or in the upper lobes. It's actually, if they tell you about upper lobe, just think about hypersensitivity in pneumonitis until proven otherwise, okay? So, and if you see it in the upper lobes, you also think about like drug-induced fibrosis. Which drugs are associated with pulmonary fibrosis? What else? Mm -hmm. Methotrexate, yeah, those are the three. 
Very good. So, and um, there is actually another one called um, rapamycin, rapamine. That's another. That's another drug that is it's an it's um, it's an uh, transplant medication, um, and that's one of the requirements you need to follow um, yearly PFTs when this. Or every time you see a patient with rapamycin, you need to ask them about pulmonary symptoms. Okay, so again, I'm gonna probably just skip this slide because I don't see any teaching purposes of this. So these are all the different diseases, like I like I was mentioning, the pulmonologists they they actually say, oh, maybe this is reticular and more honeycombing, or maybe more ground class, and they start thinking about the differential diagnosis. But this is outside the scope of your practice. I'm sorry. It's different. I don't know exactly how to tell you what, how they're different, but ground glass is more like... Ground glass is inclusions? It's more like this, yeah. So ground glass is inclusions, whereas reticular is like fibrosis? Reticular kind of looks like uh, strands or filaments. Wispy and then ground glass. Not like wispy, it's more like if you... You know like a... <coughs> how do I put it? Um, yeah, kind of more like spider webs. It's it's basically there are these like black lines. It's it's They're like more lines. Looking at like fibers, like collagen type fibers, or like elastic fibers. You know, so it's just like a ton of these little black strands. Whereas the ground glass is like a, kind of like this thin, thin, you know, like a, it's kind of like almost like you know when you have really fine bubbles and silk. Great that we had a pathologist here to explain because that's totally a pathology question. <laughs> All right, so um, bronchoscopy, the BAL has limited utility. Maybe it, it, it's helpful when you're dealing with infectious, but less helpful when you're dealing more like with autoimmune or some other like idiopathic lung diseases. Uh, but you look for eosinophilia or from um, lymphocytosis or mast cells when you have like a hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Uh, biopsy has limited utility because it helps if you have a high pretest probability for sarcoidosis or hypersensitivity pneumonitis, uh, or if you think like this probably like uh, some sort of malignancy with uh, lymphangitic spread, it's helpful. But if you're thinking about the other, like the non-specific pneumonitis, you you don't really know what to do with that biopsy. It's like when you do a skin biopsy and they tell you, oh, they see like some, I don't know inflammation or like leuco leukocytoclastic vasculitis and you your differential is very big so but it's there is a role for biopsy and, and they every time I, I go to a chest conference every Thursday because um, the, the ICU group meets with the other doctors and they always have very good lunch so I always go to that meeting and it's funny to see like all these pulmonologists they're always debating like oh I wouldn't do it and then the other guy yeah I would do it like what are you gonna do it for just give it prednisone like well but then, yeah, to have a chest conference. Oh, chest. Chest, oh, yeah. Chest. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, chest conference. And, and it's actually funny to see them debate because I'm, I'm always thinking, like, what is the utility of doing these biopsies? But if you're thinking about sarcoidosis or malignancy, it's helpful. Uh, but if you're not thinking about those things, like when I was telling you guys about renal biopsies, I only do them when I not only want to know the diagnosis, but I want to know if, I'm, if this patient is able or capable or with or tolerate treatment. If a patient is like actually multiple comorbidities or the patient is not dependable, that's it. I don't need to know what kind of kidney disease you have because whatever you have, I won't be able to treat it. So the same thing for this guy. So it's interesting how they're always debating, I should do this, I shouldn't do this. But anyway, so... Um, like the interstitial pneumonitis or the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This is why it's so confusing. Every lung disease has two names. Like for instance, the interstitial idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, they also call it usually interstitial pneumonitis. This is actually a pretty ominous disease to have. If you actually, the, you have, it's a progressive type of disease. We don't know what causes it. Usually most people are greater than 50. Most of the time it's more males than females. And Prevalence is not very high, but it's very sad because when you actually, when you actually see these patients, you know that they're gonna they're, they're gonna die from progressive lung disease, unless they they actually get a transplant. But this is this is an X-ray actually 
from uh, typical like pulmonary fibrosis. This patient is probably like already on respiratory failure. And this is a, a CT scan imaging showing like progression of the disease. Like, like, like the slide on C is actually fairly advanced. The whole tongue, lung tissue is replaced by fibrotic tissue. And this is uh, another example of progression over time. So I have one of my patients, it's very sad. Like he always comes with hypokalemia. That's the reason why they send him to me. And the reason for the hypokalemia is because the guy is always, he has a respiratory alkalosis. At the beginning he was having respiratory alkalosis. Now he has like, like hypercapnia and he's, he's actually going down. But that's how I met and he probably already died because I haven't seen him in six months. And he was already on oxygen, oxygen dependent. Yeah. So, again, inter interstitial inflammation is only mild to moderate, but um, the infiltration is by lymphocytes, plasma cells, and histiocytes, and you find the full spectrum of fibrosis. Actually, this is a slide. Can you help me, James, if you know what I'm talking about here? What do you see here? Yeah, basically the thing is that you have like these caps that form at the top of like, the lobes of the lung, where they actually become like thickened, so mm -hmm. you see like towards the edges, you'll see how it's thicker. And they just have these big bands of what they call like, uh, I think they call it bubble gum, where they have like, you know, this, this thick uh, like collagenous tissue. Um, and they, they, one of the things they said on the previous slide is that they're tempor uh, tempor um, temporally heterogeneous, which means that they're like, you know, within that tissue, you'll see like pockets that are, um, at a different amount of uh, like disease, like they progress. It's almost like it, it's pa it's a very like, patchy. Um, they also get like I think they get thickening of the uh, the arteries. There's a vessel there towards the uh, the top left corner. You have like a, right in the top corner. You can see a um, an airway, and then you, like the, what happens is you have an airway, and then you have an artery and and vein run right near it. So you have the airway, and then you have maybe that's an artery, and then a vein. And they also fit, and yeah, they have a, they have a triad, yeah. This here? That is a vein, mm -hmm. that's an artery. Right. And then to the left of it is, I believe that's bronchial, because if you see towards the inside, not only do they have um, goblet cells inside mm -hmm. the, the tissue, but they also have a little bit of um, cartilage. Mm -hmm. So it has to be broken. No, it's up towards the left, uh, towards the corner. Yeah, that's, uh -huh. that's in the Nice. I have more slides here. So the N NSIP, the, this is the second most, cause, most common cause of interstitial lung disease. Uh, basically, these patients can present with dyspnea and exertion or cough for months to years. They have like, like flu-like symptoms and more females, and there is no association with smoking. Um, these patients, they, they have crackles on exam and they, they may present with clubbing. Um, the reticular opacities on the NSIP is actually more towards the lower zone of the lungs. And uh, this is a slide showing like, like this is probably the lower part of the lungs because the heart is already like showing. And um, you can see it as more commonly like non-specific uh, non -specific interstitial pneumonitis. So, Inflammation, rheology, you see ground glass with areas of fibrosis, and um, you can actually see this, this condition coexisting with like connective tissue diseases like scleroderma. Remember when we reviewed rheumatology, I told you that this is actually one of the complications. So if you see on your, board, on your boards, either they mention NSIP or if they actually mention the word scleroderma, you think about this type of uh, pulmonary disease. So this is the, the next one is the COP, the cryptogenic organized pneumonia, uh, first described in 1983, more males and females. And then these patients actually have like similar symptoms. They have like sweats, chills, fevers, myalgias, and they have like elevated ESR, CRP, and ANCA. And uh, these patients actually, is not, it's not infectious actually. The interesting thing is like the, the, these patients present, we call it pneumonia, but it's, it's more like a, um, like nodules that they form and they have like a, they tend to have like a reticular reticular nodular pattern and that's when the pulmonologists they start saying no this is more like reticular no this is more nodular but it's probably like I believe more the rheologists because that's all they do that's that's what they do for a living so you see like nodules here in the lower part of the lungs 
and this is what, probably what they're calling reticula, right, James? Or I mean, that's so. I mean, I can't even say so dark. I, I yeah. don't totally remember. But, yeah. Um, so this is basically. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the characteristics, when I was reviewing this, one of the characteristics is like you have this patchy distribution, but there, there is preservation of the, of the lung architecture because the other diseases are actually replacing or um, disfiguring like, like COPD, like I was just telling you. Uh, but there is, there is mild interstitial chronic inflammation. Um, you do not see on the, on the, on the uh, uh, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, you do not see interstitial fibrosis. You don't see granulomas um, and necrosis or any fiber in, in the airspace. And multiple conditions can actually lead to this. Like I said, like either you have like an organizing infection, uh, uh, organizing aspiration pneumonia, you can even get it as a drug reaction or some in, in, inhaled injury. Um, uh, collagen vascular disease, Henneschel and purpura, eosinophilic lung disease, interstitial in, inflammatory bowel disease, and actually like some sort of like reaction associated with an abscess or, or cancer. So when you see the word cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, it's just a radiological, radiological pattern. It doesn't mean that you have a diagnosis. So that's, that's why the use of this in clinical practice, you know, is, is just like when you see something very abnormal, you need to tell the pulmonologist you figure it out because this may or may not be any of these things. So I think, um, what, what are you seeing here, James? I think I wrote it down in the slide, let me see. No, I didn't write any notes when I put the slide. If you look at the, uh, the, the top right corner, you see how it's like a, it's kind of much more Less, it's a lot less dense. And what I was really knowing is that you look, uh, what I was really noticing is that um, you look at the actual, like, because this is supposed to be alveolar space. If you look at the top right, um, it, it's almost like there's complete destruction of the walls of the alveoli. And then if you go towards the bottom left, it's almost like the alveoli have completely been replaced by fibrous tissue. Because this uh, DAD, Mm -hmm. No, this is actually, it was the same, the, this is the AIP. What is AIP? I've never heard of AIP is... Yeah, that's, uh, it's ARDS, right? It's indistinguishable, it's a yeah. distinguished, indistinguishable from ARDS. Uh-huh, yeah. So it, it looks like, you know, the few alveolar damage. Because it's almost like a, they, they say like in, um, in ARDS you have like the uh, alveolar spaces are like filled with like proconaceous material. Mm -hmm. And they just get replaced by that. That almost like had that look, and then it had like, like some sort of like, it almost looked like destruction. Yeah. On it's acute interstitial pneumonia. It's like. Oh, okay. AIP. So it's, this is a variant, like, a, it's a rapidly progressive form, and usually these patients, they go downhill like fairly quickly. Then I, we actually recently had a patient that was admitted, and that was the consensus from all the pulmonologists that his findings were consistent with AIP. And the mortality rate is actually really high, like after one month. This woman was 55, she was from, from some middle, no, some uh, Eastern Europe country, I can't, I can't remember. And she was completely healthy. And the lady had no prior history, like, like within a month, she was like from being normal to, to be in the ICU intubated, she ended up dying. But, uh, um, so there is actually, this is another one that is associated with smoking. This is the smoking related interstitial lung disease. Smoking is associated with many, many different types of lung disease, but there is a particular one that is associated with, um, it's called the smoking related ILD or the, you know, the DIP. DIP stands for, it's just like, I wrote it down here, desquamative interstitial pneumonia. That's what I'm telling you, you don't need to know these names, but there is a specific type of interstitial lung disease associated with smoking, and it's the DIP is uh, desquamative, desquamative interstitial pneumonia, and uh, it fortunately it's rare, it's only like less than 3% of all the interstitial lung disease, and uh, this patient has subacute illness, and they can present with like systemic symptoms, 
and the chest x-ray may appear normal but they have like very significant symptoms and they find out because they do a CT and they, they, they actually are able to see the changes and uh, these patients actually they get treated with steroids and that's why when they don't know what it is they just they tell the patient stop smoking if you don't get better we're gonna give you steroids and they give them a month follow-up and the next next thing you see is that the patient is already taking steroids and a lot of them they actually get they actually get better so they have um, this is the pathology, pigmented macrophages and peribronchial inflammation. In the rheology, you get patchy ground glass, intralobular septal thickening, and, and a mosaic pattern. Okay, so this one is probably one that you're gonna get on your boards. Just make sure you memorize this one, the hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And this is actually caused by immunological response to some sort of inhaled antigen. And usually, there are many actually, like usually organic antigens, but uh, occupations that are actually highest frequency for hypersensitivity pneumonitis are the farmers, the poultry workers, or the like birds. That's when you, in, in, if you hear in your boards that they, oh, the, this patient has a pet, like a pet parrot, they, they're probably they're probably leading you towards hypersensitivity pneumonitis, uh, or some sorts, all sorts of like animal workers, or like grain processing. They call it the grain handler lung. Uh, textiles or lumbers, they actually can develop this, and or it's also been described with inhalation of contaminated water like like people like people that love to use humidifiers you guys have you guys heard about the brain eating amoeba yeah yeah so that stuff fortunately that does that stuff doesn't exist here in california but um, they, it's been described more and more frequently in the united states from using like neti potties from tap water amoeba it's called neisseria fowler cribiform plate and it's your brain. Like there's only like two or three survivors documented to this date. You only need like one. You only need one organism, and that stuff starts like destroying your brain. And it's actually in the southeast U uh, U.S. People go in, in Europe. It's actually in the, in in the summer when the lakes get very hot. People can swim there, and they actually they get like they do like some sports in the lake, and the water forcefully goes up into your brain, like through the cribriform plate, and like no one survived that like I'm telling you like two or three persons have survived that like that we know of but anyway so like there's also another waterborne disease that is hypersensitivity pneumonitis but you know we, we call it the humidifier lung or the air conditioner lung okay so this is actually subacute hypersensitivity you can see like little nodules there and actually um, this is like the chronic phase of the um, from the birth related illness you can see like honeycombing is present in the right upper lobe and actually you can see like bronchiectasis and uh, cylindrical bronchiectasis so you you again in your boards when you hear birds you think about HP you cannot get it wrong if you get it wrong I'm gonna be very upset at you okay the treatment actually is simple you just remove the inciting an antigen and that's the reason why most pulmonologists they they tell the patients we don't know what's going on move out out of your house and we'll see if you get better and imagine how unfortunately they tell you you got better you need to destroy your whole house or hire like a company it's going to take fifty thousand dollars from you to find out what it is but uh, for patients that have severe cases and they don't get better we use corticosteroids and they have excellent prognosis and when the patients when you don't identify what's causing it and the patients go by like months or years they actually they can they can progress to end stage fibrosis it's like we were talking about acute interstitial nephritis a couple of weeks ago we identify it we stop it and patients do fine but if you don't pick it up soon enough you you're, you're going to be in trouble and that's probably one of the reasons why uh, on your boards this condition is heavily tested so i want you to always remember that I think this is, uh, these are pictures like uh, showing like uh, granuloma formation. Uh, so this is just infiltration by polymorphonuclear cells, macrophages, and this is actually early granuloma formation on the top, on the bottom left. And this is like a typical uh, non-cassiating non granuloma. Uh, and uh, these are actually sarcoidosis, which is another board favorite. So there are four different stages depending on the number of lymph nodes involvement, whether or not it's like 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 progression. I actually, have the stages here. So stage one is you only see lymph nodes like enlarged lymph nodes. Uh, this is probably the most common one. 
pulmonary function is intact and most patients actually resolve spontaneously. We don't know what causes sarcoidosis, but it's usually on your boards, it's usually an African-American woman and um, that they end up having like these findings on the x-rays and if they show you this, what is the treatment for this? Let's say they show you this x-ray and they, t they tell you African-American woman or they may show you like a picture, they did a biopsy and they show you this picture on the, on the right. So what's the treatment? Depends. You know, just, just, just uh, watchful wait. If they're not progressing, you can tell the patients, you know, 50, 55 to 90 percent, they can go into a spontaneous remission. So you need, to, you need to jump to steroids, that's what I'm trying to say. If the patient has limited, it's just an incidental finding. Sometimes patients get an x-ray to travel, or like, like patients that have like a positive PPE, they get an x-ray and they see this kind of stuff. And then this is a very common consult for a pulmonologist. They tell you, hey, you need, you need, you need, you know, you need a biopsy. But the reality is that if they do a biopsy and the diagnosis is confirmed as uh, sarcoidosis, you don't necessarily need to treat it in the stage one phase. So on the stage two, you see like the lymph nodes are more enlarged. You see some inflammation in the lungs and the lung function is impaired. So these patients definitely you give them steroids, uh, but you also have to reassure the patient that up to 70% of them, they get better that goes into spontaneous remission it's an interesting disease but it happens um, and then in the stage three um, this is when we talk about definitely treatment because only 10 to 20 resolve spontaneously and um, the lymph nodes are not necessarily enlarged but the inflammation is throughout the lungs and remember we always talk about sarcoidosis as a lung disease but sarcoidosis actually involve any possible organ actually in my practice, I've seen three cases of uh, renal sarcoidosis. And the way we treat it the same way, we treat it with steroids, but I always, I always uh, throw the ball into the pulmonologist's court because whatever they treat inflammation in the lungs, they're gonna treat in the kidneys. Um, these patients actually, but the majority of the patients, they actually have uh, lung involvement. Sarcoidosis is so crazy that actually, I've seen sarcoidosis presenting as like, a, like skin tumors. Like I've seen like pathology reports, like patients, they didn't know what, what it was. Like uh, there was, a, there was a, uh, uh, an ophthalmologist that presented a case report uh, at my hospital and he actually diagnosed sarcoidosis in the, in the uh, how do you call it, in the iris. He ended up biopsying the patient had actually granuloma. So it's pretty crazy. It can present in any part of the, of the body. We have a, um, a patient here who has, like, you know, I, I guess it would be stage four. She has it everywhere. Wow. Um, she has it in the brain, she's had several strokes, um, she's 58. So wow. She's young. She has it in her heart, they had to put a pacemaker in, she has it everywhere. And her two siblings had it, they both had uh, two PEs each and both mm -hmm. died. She's had four PEs. And what's her ethnicity? She's African American. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Okay, so you can miss that one on your boards, okay? So occupational lung diseases, you're going to get them as well? So you either have, we talk, we cover occupational asthma briefly. Uh, we cover the hypersensitivity in pneumonitis briefly. And then I'm gonna talk about the pneumoconiosis. How do you pronounce that? Pneumoconiosis. Pneumoconiosis, thank you. So the, the more common ones are the silicosis, the cold worker, pneumonia, uh, cold worker lung or pneumonitis, asbestosis, talcosis, and berylliosis. And um, so the silicosis, you know, the exposure is usually mining. They give you a history of mining, uh, tunneling, or some sort of like sandblasting jobs, and um, um, or the rubber industry. So basically, you can actually have chronic silicosis, accelerated silicosis. Uh, you can actually have a progressive massive fibrosis, which is pretty ominous, or you can have acute silicosis. So I'm going to have like some examples here. So, like chronic silicosis is usually. 10 to 30 years after the initial exposure. So if you ever, if you guys ever moonlighted before medical school doing this stuff, you're not out of the woods. I'm just letting you know. So you can become a parent after, even after removal of the exposure. And uh, it can range from anywhere from no symptoms to uh, very, very symptomatic with restrictive spirometry and low uh, DLCOs. Um, this is an x-ray of simple silicosis. There is like actually, um, you can see all these densities primarily in the upper lungs. Uh, so if they give you a history of occupational exposure in the upper lung involvement, you think about 
like this some, some sort of pneumoconiosis um, and um, the nodules are very small usually one to three millimeters so this is a chronic like after chronic exposure so the nodules can actually increase in number and and it can actually form larger lesions like here you can see like larger lesions right here so three to five millimeters in diameters for chronic silicosis uh, if they mention anything like eggshell calcification think about silicosis chronic silicosis so don't get it wrong eggshell if you hear that word eggshell calcification on the x-ray okay and then progressive mass, massive fibrosis fortunately is not the most common presentation when you're exposed to, to silicosis but um, these patients usually have like like air trapping and this is an x-ray of uh, someone with progressive massive fibrosis this patient has end-stage lung disease needs a transplant as soon as possible and, um, and, and you can also see the calcified eggshell calcification remember that okay the cold worker pneumoconiosis uh, is also known as the black lung disease or anthracilicosis um, it depends on the rate and quantity of the dust accumulation you know is the most important risk factor and this presentation is pretty similar to silicosis you can get like simple chronic or progressive uh, fibrosis um, asbestos is actually another one another one that's big heavily tested on your boards uh, that's why I asked you earlier like the pleural plaques you can actually get pleural fibrosis you can get uh, benign asbestos related pleural effusion uh, you can get asbestosis as a syndrome or mesothelioma as basically as we all know like it's all over the news um, they usually like the pleural plaques are actually the, the one of the most common findings but you can get it like after 20 years of the initial exposure and it happens up to 50 percent of the people that have been exposed to asbestos uh, my brother-in-law actually uh, is demolishing his he bought a he bought a property like a farm and he finally got the permit to demolish and part of the requirement for the permit was to contract a professional company to go in and to remove the asbestos from the property they charge him ten thousand dollars just to remove like some plumbing and some other stuff i was like thinking like oh my gosh but when you realize like how dangerous asbestos can be like it can occur in up to 50 percent of the people that were exposed to asbestos that's when you realize like why they make these kind of regulations so the parietal pleura is uh, just into the ribs is particularly along the six to nine ribs uh, along the diaphragm is actually the most common site of involvement and you can see calcifications on the chest x-ray and on the in up to 50 percent of the chest CTs so you can see the pleural plaques see it's this pleural plaque here you can see just like this thickening so this is pretty much consistent with uh, asbestos exposure until proven otherwise these are actually CT CT of the pleural plaques that I mentioned palatal so pleural fibrosis is very rare um, but it can be exacerbated as, um, when the patients are actually using uh, medications that that actually can cause pleural fibrosis she mentioned three i give you another one this is another one bromocryptin okay so benign asbestos pleural effusion is the most common pulmonary manifestation in the first 20 years of exposure um, but it can present after 50 years of exposure is amazing so the typical presentation patients present with like typical symptoms like if they have pneumonia with a with an effusion and these patients actually can resolve it spontaneously but when they do a pleural fluid analysis you can either it can be either exudative serosanguinolin predominance with eosinophils and atypical macrophages and um, occasionally it can be positive for rheumatoid factor um, again this is not necessarily a serious thing but if you develop an effusion you're probably you should probably be very worried about down the road like getting uh, mesothelioma so this is like uh, okay this is a rounded atelectasis seen uh, in this person probably with more severe involvement and uh, mesothelioma it's actually rare but it's actually the the incidence is, is very common now because all the exposure they didn't have any any control measures back in the 1960s and the 1970s so you will encounter some patients like pursuing legal action uh, but uh, any exposure may be a risk factor even if you have short-term exposure or long exposure and usually like 40 year, up to 40 years after the exposure so asbestosis 
is actually the other syndrome that you can get like like patients can develop like dyspnea crackles reduced lung volumes and some of the x-rays abnormalities um, these are the talc related diseases um, either because you inhale like silica or asbestos or IV talc injection you, you actually see these in IV drug users um, we actually seen um, a syndrome I don't know if you're ever, they're not gonna ask you this on the board but I've seen two cases of patients um, abusing cocaine that is contaminated with levamisole which is an anti-parasitic agent that they use in Latin American countries um, and these patients actually develop like a severe form of vasculitis and and like the two cases that I saw one lady had like the ear fell off and the other lady actually the nose fell off and uh, one of my co-residents actually published the case report so a lot of this this talc injection or talc contaminant is actually it's actually you're gonna see it you're gonna encounter that in clinical practice so variliosis uh, you think about aerospace automotive computer nuclear industry um, again you always need to find like what kind of job you do and what kind of job you did in the past if, if they're retired and um, you think about like like you know like these patients can present with like some irritative effect like rhinitis, pharyngitis, tracheobronchitis or chemical pneumonitis. Pleural diseases um, you know the diagnosis and this is actually another another big topic in internal medicine when you guys doing your your words you're gonna be doing thoracentesis and you're gonna be analyzing sending the fluid for analysis so make sure you're comfortable with this because um, the thoracentesis is actually is done for therapeutic purposes when the patients are actually short of breath and is also done very commonly for diagnostic purposes especially for everybody with a new onset pleural effusion is indicated that you do a thoracentesis so you're going to be doing it along with your resident and your attending um, the routine labs that we send we send LDH total protein glucose pH gram stain and culture cytology cell count and differential and other labs that are helpful but we don't always send them including the albumin the cholesterol just to roll out like a chylo chylothorax um, and uh, the adenosine deaminase ADA you guys know why we do ADA you guys remember just to roll out TV like an effusion like tuberculosis effusion is actually very high on ADA and the AFB if you suspect tuberculosis so the, the the life criteria you need to know this by heart I'm not sure for your boards and I'm, I'm pretty sure you, I, I'm gonna say probably for your boards but when you're a resident if you end up doing internal medicine you need to know the life criteria so the pleural fusion protein to serum protein um, um, greater than 0 0.5 um, and this is actually how you identify an exudate so the ratio greater than 0.5 the pleural fluid LDH with the serum LDH greater than 0.6 and the pleural fluid LDH like greater than two-thirds of the upper limits actually that's very accurate by identifying uh, an exudate compared to a 